20 is a unique chapter in the Word of God. It is unique for a number of reasons. It is the only place in the entire Bible that actually says that there will be a 1,000 year reign of Christ on the earth. It says it twice. If we didn't have Revelation chapter 20, we would be left to guess on the basis of typology. There's a lot of that. But that would be the only basis on which we could make any assumptions at all about the future. But Revelation 20 is very specific. It says there will be a thousand year reign of Christ together with his saints who will be kings and priests with him upon the earth. The second reason that this chapter is unique lies in the fact that what we have here in this 20th chapter of Revelation is the first of an, of an instalment of three chapters which actually set out the final fulfilment of the three great promises or covenants that God has made through the scriptures. The first of those, of course, was in the third chapter of the book of Genesis at verse 15. The promise of redemption through the destruction of the sin power. And Revelation 20 is all about the accomplishment of that great promise, its final fulfilment. Revelation 21 is about the fulfilment of the Abrahamic covenant and Revelation 22 is about the fulfilment of the Davidic covenant, the three great covenants that God has made in the scriptures and down through history. Another reason why this chapter is unique is that it presents to us, as far as I'm aware, the only plain indication that there will be a rebellion of the peoples of the earth towards the end of the rule of Christ. It also gives us a glimpse of something which is not revealed very frequently in the Bible. Just a glimpse of the time beyond the millennium when God will be all and in all and there will be no more mortality upon the earth and therefore there will be no more sin, suffering, pain, death and the tears and the sadness that comes from those things. And lastly, but perhaps not the only uh, the only one, because there will be others which make this chapter unique, is the fact that I'm not aware of any other place in the Bible which actually aligns the devil and the dragon and Satan with the serpent of the Garden of Eden, called in verse 2, that old serpent. We shall come to him in a moment. So we have a very interesting chapter before us, and we've been working through the book of the, the Revelation or the Apocalypse, for the last two or three years, we are reaching the culmination. The time when God will resolve all the problems of humanity and bring an end to the sufferings that have come through the actions of the serpent way back in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago. We can be very thankful about that. God has the answer for the problems of mankind. He has the answer for the problems of our families. He has the answer for our individual problems. Let's see exactly what that is. Because it will come at different stages for different people. So then, in our last consideration, our brother Peter Osborne dealt with ch uh, chapter 19, the latter portion of chapter 19. There's a very definite con connection and link between the 19th chapter and Revelation chapter 20. And we need to see that link. In verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19, we read these words, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, in actual fact, that verse provides for us the internal answers to the symbology that is used. We have one sitting on a white horse. Now white in the scripture is the colour for righteousness. And a horse in the scriptures is a symbol, amongst other things, for warfare. And so we have the answer given towards the end of that verse. And in righteousness, that aligns with white, he doth judge and make war, that aligns with the horse. So this is all about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you only got to read on and you find it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and those who are with him in the day of divine judgments. And so, Revelation 20 is actually going to tell us something about the culmination of those judgments and what they affect in the earth. John Thomas wrote in Eureka, volume 5, page 320, these words concerning the triumph of the rider on the white horse. He said, The blessed and, and only potentate upon the white horse with the hosts of heaven marching at the head of his army from his capital against the kings of the earth and their forces is the apocalyptic angel descending with key and chain to arrest, imprison and destroy the powers of the world. So the latter portion of chapter 19 is about that work, about chaining the rulers of the earth and getting rid of human governments, removing all human armies, destroying all opposition to the rule of Christ in the earth. And that's why we read in verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. It's about locking people up or disposing of them, removing them from positions of authority so that they can no longer influence events in the earth again. But it says there in verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven. What does this mean? Well, heaven in the apocalypse is actually, of course, a symbol for governments or rulership. John Thomas again comments in that same quote from Eureka. He says, When potentates leave their capitals on warlike expeditions, they are said to descend, that is, come down, to descend upon the countries they invade. So with this angel, he descends from the heaven of his habitation and government because Christ will have established his power in Jerusalem after the battle of Armageddon. He descends from this position of authority, as it were, upon those who oppose him, upon the territories of the devil and Satan, and he removes them. And it says in verse 1, he has the key of what is called the bottomless pit. And this is interesting. A bottomless pit. An unheard of thing, perhaps. But it's language that speaks in this context of the sea. No one has really fully plumbed the depths of the sea. Even with man's greatest technologies, that is an impossibility. So the sea is referred to here. This word that is translated by the translators in this version that I'm reading from is a word in the Greek, abusos, from which we get our English word abyss, an immeasurable depth, somewhere that no one can explore, so to speak. It refers here to the sea, we believe. And the sea in the scriptures is a symbol for the nations. Isaiah 17, verses 12 and 13, Isaiah 57, verse 20, and passages like that make that palpably obvious. So then, as John Thomas again comments, to have the key of the abyss is to possess the power of developing political organisations or of suppressing them. And that's what this verse is about. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ accompanied by his saints, suppressing the political organisations of mankind that he might establish fully the kingdom of God on the earth. That word, by the way, abusos in the Greek, is used by the Septuagint translators, that is the Greek version of the Old Testament. They translated the Hebrew word used in Isaiah 44 verse 27 and translated in the AV deep. They used the word abusos. That saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. Clearly the deep there in Isaiah 44, verse 27, is a reference to the sea. Now, when we then read again, with this understanding, verse 1, we have an angel that is a powerful one. The, we believe the same one as verse 11 of chapter 19, who rides upon the white horse, the Lord Jesus Christ, who descends from his position of authority, which he's established by his power, that he might remove every last skerrick of human opposition to his rule. He has the key, that is the power, to open and to shut. He has the key to remove the governments of the nations who are in opposition to him. He has a symbolic chain by which he is going to lock them up 
And that's, of course, why that illustration, which we use in our opening slide, sets forth a dragon-like creature being chained by this mighty angel. And you'll notice that it's in the sea that this is happening. So then, we believe that when we come to verse 2, it is fairly easy to understand the use of the terms dragon, devil, and Satan. Because in the apocalypse, they have referred to the powers who down through the centuries have opposed the will of God and certainly opposed his servants and have persecuted them, have set themselves up against him. They are to be completely and totally removed from any influence in the world again. So we read in verse 2 that he laid hold on the dragon. And a reference back to chapter 12, verse 3 will show us that this speaks of sin manifested politically and indeed religiously against God and his servants. He lays hold on this dragon. And then we have a very interesting comment. That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Now, as you can see, the word dragon, dracon, in the Greek, means a dragon or a great serpent. The term devil, diabolos, means a false accuser or a slanderer. And Satan, satanus, in the Greek, has the idea of an adversary, one who opposes another in purpose or act. So here we have a power that is to be subdued in order to establish the kingdom of God. Because it says at the end of verse 2, and he binds him for a thousand years. So for a thousand years, this particular power is to be bound. Now this power, of course, is actually human nature. Human nature in its opposition to God. Robert Roberts wrote this in his exposition of the apocalypse called 13 Lectures on the Apocalypse. On page 174, he said, The dragon is the heraldic symbol of human hostility to God. Officially incorporate in the kings and governments in which it is headed up. So what we, what we are being told here is an extremely important fact. It is that God does not intend to allow men to go on ruling for very much longer. As we know, all the signs are there that Christ is about to appear in the earth. The world is falling apart. It is falling apart because of human incompetence and human wickedness and human hostility to God and to his principles. There is hardly a divine principle upheld anywhere in the world today. There is just here and there tiny lights of uprightness and divine principle to be seen in the earth. Governments nowadays, of whichever colour they might be, are imbued with spirits that do not belong to God. Hence, there is every form of wickedness in the earth. And that is what this is telling us is going to be removed, bound for a thousand years. Men, in their hostility to God, are going to be overthrown. And divine principles and divine righteousness is going to be established in the earth for a thousand years and then permanently into eternity. That is the great hope that is presented for us in Revelation chapter 20. And we can be very, very thankful about that. It's horrendous, isn't it? Absolutely horrendous what is happening in our world and it is reaching into every corner of human civilization and it doesn't matter who you are you will be touched by it its days are numbered and so we have this wonderful promise held out in verse 2 so what happens to this old serpent you see it says old serpent because the scripture wants us to go right back to the beginning to Genesis chapter 3 
to the first known serpent, the one who could speak words, words that were taken up by Eve and then by Adam, bringing to pass sin and the fall of mankind and all the evil and the wickedness and corruption and the violence which has filled the earth ever since can be attributed to the reasoning, the carnal reasoning of that original serpent, the old serpent. What's going to happen to this old serpent? Well, it says in verse 3, he cast him into the bottomless pit, that is, the powers that now exist, who in many cases will oppose Christ when he comes soon, are going to be destroyed, overthrown, and as it were, dispersed among the nations, having no more influence over the nations. They are cast into the bottomless pit and shut up, and a, set, a, a seal is set upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. He's going to have another day of opportunity, as it were. Human nature, being what it is, when it is given the opportunity at the end of the thousand year rule of Christ, is going to burst forth once again in rebellion against God. Human hostility to God will be renewed. That's a remarkable fact, but it's going to happen. And the behaviour of humankind today is virtual proof that it will happen even in a perfect environment. So as we've said, all of these problems can be, can be attributed to the old serpent back in the Garden of Eden. And his ultimate destruction, what he stood for, carnality, opposition to God, is ultimately doomed, but it will have its final outburst at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's the saddest feature, perhaps, of this chapter, but not one that is unexpected to those who understand the power of the old serpent. So let's just illustrate this, perhaps, this time period, by looking at what is going to happen as it's set forth here. We have the thousand-year reign of Christ, it is preceded, we believe, by a period of 50 years called the Jubilee period in which the kingdom of God is established. It's in this period that the man on the white horse, to comp accompanied by others on, the white, on white horses, will go forth. And over a course of 40 years of intense judgment, they will subdue the nations and establish the kingdom of God. That is the process of binding the old serpent. However, at the end of this period of a thousand years, there is also called, in verse 4, a little season. Sorry, in the end of verse 3, a little season. We don't know whether it's the same period as the one at the beginning, but what we do know is that it's a period of opportunity for men to show what they really feel about the rulers that God has given them for that thousand years and their decision we understand from the words that are used is going to be rejection. They will reject the rulers that God has given them and will in the course of that be destroyed themselves. So then we have the binding of the serpent back here. That's where we are in verse 1 of Revelation 20. We have the serpent bound for a thousand years. That's the message of verse 2. We have the serpent unleashed that's the message of verse 7, which we'll, we will come to in a moment. And, of course, the end of verse 4, at uh, the end of verse 3, I should say. And we have, ultimately, the eradication or total destruction of the serpent when the judgments at the end of this period will finally be over and there will no longer be anyone upon the earth who has any ability to oppose the will of God. It will simply be impossible for them so to do because they will all be immortal beings like unto God himself and incapable of sin and of death. That's the message, the wonderful message of Revelation chapter 20. So pressing on, another quotation from John Thomas. Sin's flesh, he says, is to be turned out of office 
and to exist only in absolute subjection to spirit as manifested in Jesus and his brethren. And we come to them when we come to verses 4 to 6 of this chapter. Because he says there, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. We'll find out who that they are in a moment. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, which we've found in our studies in the Apocalypse as a reference to the Roman Catholic system and the politics of that system as it dominated the world for centuries in past times, neither his image, a reference to the religion of the Roman Catholic system, which dominated the world for centuries and would allow no one else any right to worship as they saw fit, neither had received his mark, that's a reference to the commerce which was governed by the Roman Catholic system in Europe for centuries, where no one could trade unless they had the mark of the beast, the sign of the cross. These are the ones who suffered persecution. They have been raised from the dead, as we go to see in verses 5 and 6. They've been raised from the dead. They have been given a new nature, no longer mortal. They have been changed into the nature of God himself, even as his son was changed 2,000 years ago. And they now share in not only the nature of God, but his character, which they developed through the trials and tribulations of their time of probation. These are the ones who were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus because they stood up for the word of God and, which, and had not bowed down to the beast manifested in so many different ways. And it says that they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And when it says they lived there, You'll notice in verse 5, in the next verse, it says, And the rest of the dead lived not again. So the living again is what's being referred to. These people, as I said, had been mortal once. Many of them had suffered persecution, even unto death. Now they live again by resurrection from the dead. This is actually a reference to immortality. This is not just life as we understand life. This is immortal life. This is divine life. They lived and reigned with Christ. So they're not living immortally to do nothing. They are living to reign with Christ for a thousand years. As I said, this is the only place in the New Testament, in fact in the scripture, which makes reference to the thousand year reign of Christ. And it says in verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. Now that sentence is actually in parenthesis in the Greek. It's like a little aside. Because you see it's telling us that these ones who appear in verse 4 are an extremely privileged class of people. They're not like the rest of mankind who are still being mortal, who will live through that thousand years. Because life will be extended, we believe, in the millennial age. Men will live for hundreds of years as they once did at the beginning of time. These are not like those who will live out their lives as mortal beings and die and have to be raised again. These people will never, ever see or experience for themselves anything that belongs to mortality ever again. They will see it in others. But for them, mortality and all that that means, the sin, the burdens, the heartache, the sadness, it's gone for them forever. That's why it says at the end of verse 5, this is the first resurrection. And then it says this, Blessed. And that word, makarios, in the Greek, means a perpetual happiness. Perpetually happy and holy. 
or separate is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death which by the way means a death from which there is no recovery and the bulk of mankind who are ignorant of the ways of God today or those who have been ignorant of God's ways in the past have suffered as it were the second death they will never see the light of day again on such the second death oblivion hath no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years so to reign means that you're a king to be a priest means you have a dual role. And when Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God, he will come as a king priest after the order of Melchizedek, we read. And he will not be alone in his thousand-year rule, for he will raise from the dead those who are responsible to divine judgment. And to those who are found worthy, he will give them the blessedness and the holiness of the first resurrection. These people will never have to contend with the problem of mortality ever again. So here they are. The imagery of the apocalypse. There is the king on his throne. And there is the vast multitude that no man can number who surround him, who sing the praises of God and of the Lamb and reign with him for a thousand years. And verse 6, as we read, tells us of their blessedness and their holiness. And so this is something that we can look forward to with great anticipation. The world needs this time desperately, and so do we all. So we come then to verses 7 and 8. Now this introduces us to the time when at the end of the thousand years, the old serpent, the devil and Satan of verse 2, which we have found represents human hostility to God, which has been bound for that thousand years, is released. In other words, the rule of Christ and the saints will be relaxed. It seems from verse 9 that the saints who have been reigning with Christ and who will have had a role throughout the earth, ruling over certain territories, will be withdrawn because it tells us in verse 9 that they compassed, these rebels, they compassed the camp of the saints about. It's a reference, we believe, to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, to the temple of the future age, which you can see illustrated there. It's this place here against which they come. So it appears as though the saints have been withdrawn. And there's been a relaxation of the strict rule that has applied for a thousand years. What do you think mankind's going to do? Well, it doesn't take too much observation to know what happens amongst men when divine principles, or any law for that matter, or any exertion of force to uphold law is withdrawn or relaxed. We know what human nature does. You beauty, they're gone. And these people have been living for hundreds of years. They don't suffer as men suffer today, dreadful afflictions. They will think that they're immortal. Though they aren't. And they will take the opportunity to revolt. So it says in verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, the Greek word teleo means to be complete or concluded. It tells us, that Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So this power that was referred to back in verse 2 is now back in business again. Human beings, mortal human beings, have the same nature that you and I have today. Now that the pressure is off, it begins to foment revolt. It says he will be loosed out of his prison. That's a reference back to verses 1 and 2. To chains, binding these people, as it were, putting them out of business. Well, now they're back in business. They've got opportunity, and they use it. And some of them go around stirring up revolt. It says in verse 8, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. That word deceive 
Porneo means to lead astray. So there's going to be very act, active people, rebels, who will involve others in their rebellion, who will induce them to lead them astray from the right way that they have been taught for a thousand years. It tells us in verse 8 that they go to the four corners of the earth to Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Now, Gog and Magog are terms used of the powers that will arraign themselves against Israel and then against Christ when he returns to establish the kingdom of God. So this Gog and Magog cannot be a reference to the original powers by that name of Ezekiel 38. Because they will have been put out of business. That's what verses 1 to 3 is about. There will be no Gog and Magog during that thousand year reign of Christ. So why are these terms used? Well, you see, they're used because it is the spirit that motivated Gog and Magog of tomorrow that will be seen again at the end of the thousand year rule of Christ. It is the spirit of antagonism or hostility to the principles of God. There's also another fact. And that is, of course, that Gog and Magog are allied with Amalek. And Amalek in the scripture is a reference to human self-interest in the way that it will not submit to divine principles because it wants to seek its own way. We haven't got time to go into that aspect now. So here we have human nature in revolt against Christ and the saints. And it says to gather them to the battle. Now that language is actually the same as Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. That's why this slide is headed up. The spirits of liberty, equality and fraternity revived here in Revelation 20 verses 7 and 8. Because in Revelation chapter 16, the times in which we are living now, those spirits that came from the French Revolution of liberty, equality and fraternity are, are what is bringing... The powers of the world to Armageddon, it says in Revelation 16 and verse 14 and 16. So this same spirit is there, active again. Now that word battle there in verse 8 is the Greek word polemos. It means warfare. And that word is used, interestingly enough, by the Septuagint in Exodus 17 and verse 16. In relation to Amalek, I will have war with Amalek. From generation to generation, as we said, Amalek represents in the word of God human self-interest in opposition to God. It is that spirit that is back in business at the end of the thousand years. Now some people have difficulty with that. I have known people that have had difficulty with that. How can you have a thousand years of, of perfect government, a wonderful environment, the complete absence of revolt, sin, violence, and all the things that blight human society. Today. How could you have that and then have a massive rebellion at the end? Well... I've only got one response to that. Sit down and reflect upon your life and whether or not there has been any time when you've been given an opportunity when you don't think that anybody is looking and watching when your nature hasn't decided that it's time to rebel. Anyone who really understands human nature doesn't have a problem with the revolt at the end of the millennium. It is capable of anything. And the best of men know they can't give it an inch because it takes a mile. So there's no problem. There will be a revolt. 
at the end of the thousand years. Now I'm going to very quickly take you on a, a ride. You might want to look up the book of Joshua, you may not. But I've got to do this very quickly. I want to show you that what we have here in Revelation chapter 20 is not new. It was actually prophesied in the book of Joshua. Because the basis and the language that is used here in Revelation 20 is drawn from Joshua. So very quickly, I'm going to summarise before you the content of the book of Joshua. Joshua 3 and 4, and this is content that has to do with prophecy. Joshua, of course, is a book of history, but it's actually a book of prophecy. It was pointing forward. Joshua is the Old Testament name for Jesus. So Joshua was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Joshua 3 and 4, Israel crossed Jordan. It, re it re uh, referred to the baptism of the Spirit. Forty years before they'd crossed the Red Sea, there was a baptism of water. And Jesus said, there has to be a baptism of water and of the Spirit. For anyone to come to the kingdom of God. So here we have the baptism of the Spirit. The saints, as it were, immortalised in Christ when Israel crossed over into their inheritance. As the saints will shortly do under the leadership of Yahshua. Yahweh's salvation. In Joshua 5, we have circumcision reinstituted in Israel after they had crossed the Jordan. This is a prophecy of the time when the saints will enter into immortality. Because you see, circumcision, the cutting off of the flesh, is figurative not only of baptism, Paul uses it that way in Colossians chapter 2, it is also a figure of laying off mortality. So the circumcision of Israel for the second time lines up with the saints divesting themselves of of mortality at the judgment seat when they are given the gift of eternal life. The manna, which represents the word of God in probation, ceases in Joshua chapter 5. It is not required. Because you see, in immortality, we will not need the word of God in the way we need it today. We will then be in every sense of the word, the word made flesh. Joshua and the captain of the host are identified in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua goes to look at Jericho. He meets the captain of God's host. We believe that was Michael, the archangel, because the place on which he stood was holy ground. The personal representative of God was there. And the Lord Jesus Christ is described in Daniel chapter 12 as Michael, your prince, he is coming to be the captain of God's host. Joshua 6, Jericho is overthrown by an earthquake. There are seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days, seven times around the city. They prefigure, we believe, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials and the seven thunders of the apocalypse. But even after Jericho, Babylonian influences were still there, just as it will be after Armageddon. Babylonian or Catholic influences will still be there in opposition to God. Joshua 7 sees the sin of Achan revealed and the tribe of Judah purified. This is a prophecy of the time when the Lord Jesus Christ, after Armageddon, will have humbled the Jews by the events of Armageddon and he will, he will cleanse the house of Judah and cause it to mourn as they did in the times when Achan's sin was revealed. Joshua 8 sees the defeat of Ai. This is a reference, we believe, in prophecy to the time when purified Judah, the Jews in the land, will be victorious over the surrounding nations and will enter into a new covenant with their God. Joshua chapter 9 is the deception of the Gibeonites. We believe this is a reference to the time when after Armageddon, certain powers, the Tarshish powers, submit to Christ but feignedly out of fear, as Psalm 66 verse 3 says they will, they will come with a dishonest heart, says that psalm, just as the Gibeonites came to Joshua, with a dishonest heart. They were fearful. They wanted to submit. They knew they couldn't beat Israel. But they didn't want to become Israelites. So it will be with the nations. There will be a lot more work to convert them to the way of truth. But they will submit in time, just as the Gibeonites became 
servants in the temple of God and in many cases proved more faithful than the Israelites themselves. So what comes next? Joshua 10. Now very quickly in Joshua 10, this is what happens. You have a leader of a confederacy of five nations. He's called Adonai Zedek, Lord of Righteousness. We believe he's a pro it's a prophecy of the Pope as Antichrist. He's called the King of Jerusalem. That was a papal title. It was a claim of the papacy during the Crusades that Jerusalem belonged to them, that the Pope was the King of Jerusalem. Gibeon is attacked by this confederacy led by Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. It's a type, we believe, of the Tarshish powers being attacked by the Catholic system because they've submitted to Christ. Verse 5 tells us of this confederacy of five kings. Five is the number of grace. And we know, of course, that the papacy believes itself to be the arbiter of grace. Verse 11 tells us that this confederacy is destroyed by hailstones, selectively. And in Revelation 16, verse 21, we read that Christ's judgments upon the system that has done so much to blind the nations to the truth of God will be by hailstones. And Babylon the Great comes into, into remembrance before him, destroyed by hailstones that we believe is a type of the saints in their individual capacity to judge. In verse 13, there's an extended day. Joshua chapter 10 is a remarkable chapter. A day is extended. Unheard of. Unbelievable except by divine power. And it's that day that's referred to in Zechariah chapter 14. The day when God went forth to battle. And that day refers to the 40-year period of judgment which we poured out upon the nations led by Catholicism in their opposition to Christ. Verse 14 tells us that Yahweh fought for Israel that day. And verse 24 of Joshua 10 tells us that Joshua says to the princes of the nation, put your feet on the necks of these kings. So flesh is subdued. And Paul says in Romans 16.20, God shall bruise Satan under thy feet shortly. That's the subject matter of Revelation 20. Satan, the adversary. Verse 27 tells us that these five kings are buried deep in a cave. And Rome and the papacy are cast into the abyss. Revelation 18, 21, 19, 20 and 20 verse 3 as we've read. And verses 28 to 39 of Joshua chapter 10 spell out seven cities that are overthrown. And that lines up with the seven campaigns of Christ against the nations to subdue them. And verse 42, perhaps we might just have a quick look at the end of Joshua chapter 10. Because I want to take you now to Joshua chapter 11. Verse 42 of Joshua chapter 10 says this, And all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time. Because Yahweh God of Israel fought for Israel. And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, unto the camp to Gilgal. In other words, there is a pause in the conflict, in the fighting, and the warfare that had characterised Israel's crossing of the Jordan, their taking of Jericho. Now there comes a time of rest and peace. But there's one more battle to be fought before Israel takes the land. And that's the one described in chapter 11. So Joshua 10 is about the overthrow, in prophecy, of the Catholic system that will rebel against Christ after Armageddon. And there will be 40 years of conflict to subdue that power. And then comes the millennium, the time of peace and of rest. And then we have Joshua chapter 11. Now in Joshua 11 verse 1 we meet Jabin, king of Hazor, who puts together a confederacy. His name means intelligent or wise. That's what is said about the serpent in Genesis 3 verse 1. He was more subtle, more perceptive than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Jabin is a dynastic name like Pharaoh. There were two who ruled from Hazor 
The other one was in Judges chapter 4, verse 2. And in both these contexts of Joshua 11 and Judges 4, Jabin is set forth as a type of the serpent in political manifestation. He's the king of Canaan, we are told. Canaan, humiliated. Paul picks up that idea in Philippians 3.21 when he says that Christ is coming to change our vile body. Poor translation. Should be rendered, Christ is coming to change the body of our humiliation that it might be made like unto his glorious body. Anyone haven't been humiliated by their nature? He's coming to change it in those that are faithful. So here we've got the king of Canaan, this man who represents the serpent. And when we come to make a comparison between these two contexts, this is what we find. Now, you might want to do this exercise. You might just want to look at the screen. I don't care. But what you will see is this, that Revelation 20 is drawn straight from Joshua chapter 11. I mean, straight from Joshua 11. Verse 1 refers to Jabin in Joshua 11, the intelligent, the wise. Verse 2 of Revelation 20 refers to the old serpent, more subtle than any beast. In Joshua 11, verses 2 and 3, we read that Jabin draws his confederacy from the north, the south, the west, to the east, from the four points of the compass, or as it's put in Revelation 20, verse 8, from the four quarters of the earth. In Joshua 11, verse 4, we read that his confederacy was like the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude. In Revelation 20, and at verse 8, we read, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. In Joshua 11, verse 5, we, meet, we read that they met together. In Revelation 20, verse 9, we read that they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. They met together in a place of rebellion. In Joshua 11, verse 5, we read that the place was Merom. Now, Merom happens to mean height or elevation. In Revelation 20, verse 9, there's a reference to Jerusalem or Zion. And Psalm 48 verse 2 tells us that in the kingdom age, Zion will be notable for many things, but one of them is its elevation. Beautiful for elevation is Mount Zion, the joy of the whole earth. It's that place to which they come. Joshua 11 verse 6 tells us that their chariots were burned with fire by Joshua and Israel. <clears throat> and Revelation 20 verse 9 tells us that fire came from God out of heaven and consumed this vast company of rebels. In Joshua 11 verse 8, we read that Yahweh delivered them into the hand of Israel who smote them and chased them unto great Sidon and unto Mishrefoth Maim. And if you have the same margin in your Bible as I have in mine, you'll see it says, burnings of waters. When was the last time you saw water on fire? They use water to put fires out. This is the burnings of waters. And Revelation 20 verse 10 tells us that they were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. In Joshua 11 verse 8 it tells us that he left them none remaining. And in Revelation 20 verse 8 we read about the second death. Mortality is abolished. Joshua 11 verse 11 tells us he left none to breathe. If you're not breathing, you're not using oxygen. No one will use oxygen when the judgments that complete the destruction of mortality, which is what Revelation 20 is about, are done. No one will breathe oxygen. They won't need oxygen. Mortality will be abolished. And no mortals remain in Revelation 20 and verse 15. And Joshua 11 verse 23 tells us in the last sentence of this chapter, and the land rested from war. 
And Revelation 20 is all about the ultimate destruction of the serpent and there will be no rebellion ever again against God. The old serpent will be totally destroyed. So the basis, the basis of the language that we have and of the ideas that we have in Revelation chapter 20 is solidly drawn from that remarkable prophecy in the book of Joshua. It doesn't end there. Joshua 12 sees 31 kings subdued in their land given to Israel. And that prefigures the destruction of all opposition to divine rule and the dissolution of all nations, which is what will happen at the end of the millennium. And only Israel will remain. And that is the subject matter of Revelation 21 and the fulfilment of the Abrahamic covenant. More about that later on. Then we read in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10 about this lake of fire. It's also used elsewhere in this chapter. But in verse 10 it says, And the devil, that's the power of verse 2, that deceived them, human nature was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet were cast. That is, a thousand years or so previously they had been cast there. And she'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Can't get any longer than that. Total oblivion. That's what the lake of fire represents. Not a literal lake burning with fire. He's talking about absolute, total, full destruction. Can't be any more complete than that. And that is the end of all those who oppose God. In whatever way that might be. And then he says in verses 11 and 12 that he sees a great throne. A great white throne. A throne of righteousness and one sitting on it. No doubt about who that is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in his second act as arbiter and judge of all responsible people at the end of the millennium. It says, whose faith, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. In other words, the age that has passed the thousand year rule, an era of time, has ended. From now on, there's going to be no ages, just eternity. This is the last great assize when the destiny of men is decided. It won't impact those who have been immortal, who have reigned with him for a thousand years, but they will be involved. There's no doubt about that. Verse 12 is clear about that. It says, I saw the dead who had died during the thousand year reign of Christ, the mortal peoples of the earth, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. These books had been kept as records. Records of people's lives. Down through that thousand years. No doubt about who will keep those. The saints who will rule over those peoples. They will be the ones who keep the records. And those books are kept until this day of judgment. Just as there is a record being kept of our lives today if we are responsible to divine judgment. And they're judged out of, the, of those books according to their works. And if their name is not found in the book of life, then they are doomed. And it says in verse 13... And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, that is, the nations, who have existed during the thousand-year reign of Christ. People have lived and died. They gave up the dead. And death and the grave, Hades is the word, death and the grave delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and, and the grave were cast into the lake of fire. So the final act is to remove death itself. Because no one, from this point on, no one is ever going to be buried under the ground again. Now we find this a little bit hard to cope with, don't we? But it's going to happen. And we need to look to this day 
perhaps in a sense, even more than we look to the return of Christ. Because sadness and sorrow, and sickness and suffering and death will not be eradicated until this is fulfilled. Even in the perfections or virtual perfections of the kingdom age, death will still play a part with all that goes with that. So it says it in verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What a remarkable chapter this is. What a remarkable series of chapters this is. Revelation 20, as we said, is all about the fulfilment of Genesis 3.15. The old serpent bound and finally destroyed. Sin and rebellion totally eradicated. Death abolished. Revelation 21 is about the Abrahamic covenant being fulfilled. With its holy city, the one nation Israel, embracing all peoples. Final perfection in the earth. And Revelation 22 is about the fulfilment of the Davidic promise. Isn't that a remarkable thing? Except, of course, that the author of the Bible was the God who made those promises.